Section 1 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 1. MY OWN TRUE GHOST STORY BY RUDYARD KIPLING As I came through the desert, thus it was, as I came through the desert, the city of dreadful night. Somewhere in the other world, where there are books and pictures and plays and shop windows to look at, and thousands of men who spend their lives in building up all four, lives a gentleman who writes real stories about the real insides of people, and his name is Mr. Walter Besant. But he will insist upon treating his ghosts. He has published half a workshop full of them, with levity. He makes his ghost seers talk familiarly, and in some cases flirt outrageously with the phantoms. You may treat anything from a viceroy to a vernacular paper with levity, but you must behave reverently toward a ghost, and particularly an Indian one. There are in this land ghosts who take the form of fat, cold, pobby corpses, and hide in trees near the roadside till a traveller passes. Then they drop upon his neck and remain. There are also terrible ghosts of women who have died in childbed. These wander along the pathways at dusk, or hide in the crops near a village, and call seductively. But to answer their call is death in this world, and the next. Their feet are turned backward that all sober men may recognize them. There are ghosts of little children who have been thrown into wells. These haunt well curbs and the fringes of jungles, and wail under the stars, or catch women by the wrist, and beg to be taken up and carried. These, and the corpse ghosts, however, are only vernacular articles, and do not attack sahibs. No native ghost has yet been authentically reported to have frightened an Englishman. But many English ghosts have scared the life out of both white and black. Nearly every other station owns a ghost. There are said to be two at Simla, not counting the woman who blows the bellows at Sairi Dak Bungalow on the old road. Mussoorie has a house haunted of a very lively thing. A white lady is supposed to do night watchmen round a house in Lahore. Dalhousie says that one of her houses repeats on autumn evenings all the incidents of a horrible horse and precipice accident. Marie has a merry ghost, and, now that she has been swept by cholera, will have room for a sorrowful one. There are officers' quarters in Mia Mia, whose doors open without reason, and whose furniture is guaranteed to creak, not with the heat of June, but with the weight of invisibles who come to lounge in the chairs. Peshawar possesses houses that none will willingly rent, and there is something, not fever, wrong with a big bungalow in Allahabad. The other provinces simply bristle with haunted houses and march phantom armies along their main thoroughfares. Some of the dark bungalows on the Grand Trunk Road have handy little cemeteries on their compound. Witnesses to the changes and chances of this mortal life in the days when men drove from Calcutta to the northwest. These bungalows are objectionable places to put up in. They are generally very old, always dirty, while the Kansama is as ancient as the bungalow. He either chatters senilely or falls into the long trances of age. In both moods, he is useless. If you get angry with him, 
He refers to some Sahib dead and buried these thirty years, and says that when he was in that Sahib's service, not a Kanshamak in the province could touch him. Then he jabbers and mows and trembles and fidgets among the dishes, and you repent of your irritation. In these dark bungalows, ghosts are most likely to be found, and when found, they should be made a note of. Not long ago, it was my business to live in dark bungalows. I never inhabited the same house for three nights running, and grew to be learned in the breed. I lived in government-built ones with red brick walls and rail ceilings, an inventory of the furniture posted in every room, and an excited snake at the threshold to give welcome. I lived in converted ones, old houses officiating as dark bungalows where nothing was in its proper place, and there wasn't even a fowl for dinner. I lived in second-hand palaces, where the wind blew through open-work marble tracery, just as uncomfortably as through a broken pane. I lived in dark bungalows, where the last entry in the visitor's book was fifteen months old, and where they slashed off the curry kid's head with a sword. It was my good luck, to meet all sorts of men, from sober travelling missionaries and deserters flying from British regiments, to drunken loafers who threw whisky bottles at all who passed, and my still greater good fortune to just escape a maternity case, seeing that a fair proportion of the tragedy of our lives out here acted itself in dark bungalows. I wondered that I had met no ghosts. A ghost that would voluntarily hang about a dark bungalow, would be mad, of course. But so many men have died mad in dark bungalows, that there must be a fair percentage of lunatic ghosts. In due time I found my ghost, or ghosts, rather, for there were two of them. Up till that hour I had sympathized with Mr. Besant's method of handling them, as shown in the strange case of Mr. Lucraft and other stories. I am now in the opposition. We will call the bungalow Katmandak Bungalow, but that was the smallest part of the horror. A man with a sensitive hide has no right to sleep in dark bungalows. He should marry. Katmandak Bungalow was old and rotten and unrepaired. The floor was of worn brick. The walls were filthy and the windows were nearly black with grime. It stood on a bypath largely used by native sub-deputy assistants of all kinds, from finance to forests. But real sahibs were rare. The Kansama, who was nearly bent double with old age, said so. When I arrived, there was a fitful, undecided rain on the face of the land, accompanied by a restless wind, and every gust made a noise like the rattling of dry bones in the stiff, toddy palms outside. The Kansama completely lost his head on my arrival. He had served a sahib once. Did I know that sahib? He gave me the name of a well-known man who has been buried for more than a quarter of a century, and showed me an ancient daguerreotype of that man in his prehistoric youth. I had seen a steel engraving of him, at the head of a double volume of memoirs a month before, and I felt ancient beyond telling. The day shut in, and the Khan Samak went to get me food. He did not go through the pretense of calling it Kana, man's victuals. He said Ratub, and that means, among other things, grub, dog's rations. There was no insult in his choice of the term. He had forgotten the other word, I suppose. While he was cutting up the dead bodies of animals, I settled myself down, after exploring the dark bungalow. There were three rooms, beside my own, which was a corner kennel, each giving into the other through dingy white doors fastened with long iron bars. The bungalow was a very solid one, but the partition walls of the rooms were almost jerry-built in their flimsiness. Every step 
or bang of a trunk echoed from my room down the other three, and every footfall came back tremulously from the far walls. For this reason I shut the door. There were no lamps, only candles in long glass shades. An oil wick was set in the bathroom. For bleak, unadulterated misery, that dark bungalow was the worst of the many that I had ever set foot in. There was no fireplace, and the window would not open. So a brazier of charcoal would have been useless. The rain and the wind splashed and gurgled and moaned round the house, and the toddy palms rattled and roared. Half a dozen jackals went through the compound singing, and the hyena stood afar off and mocked them. A hyena would convince us at the sea of the resurrection of the dead, the worst sort of dead. Then came the ratub, a curious meal, half native and half English in composition, with the old Khan Shama babbling behind my chair about dead and gone English people, and the wind-blown candles playing shadow bo-peep with the bed and the mosquito curtains. It was just a sort of dinner and evening, to make a man think of every single one of his past sins, and of all the others that he intended to commit if he lived. Sleep, for several hundred reasons, was not easy. The lamp in the bathroom threw the most absurd shadows into the room, and the wind was beginning to talk nonsense. Just when the reasons were drowsy with blood-sucking, I heard the regular, let us take and heave him over, grunt of duly bearers in the compound. First one duly came in, then a second, and then a third. I heard the duly's dumped on the ground, and the shutter in front of my door shook. That's someone trying to come in, I said. But no one spoke, and I persuaded myself that it was the gusty wind. The shutter of the room next to mine was attacked, flung back, and the inner door opened. That's some sub-deputy assistant, I said, and he has brought his friends with him. Now they'll talk and spit and smoke for an hour. But there were no voices and no footsteps. No one was putting his luggage into the next room. The door shut and I thanked Providence that I was to be left in peace. But I was curious to know where the Dooleys had gone. I got out of bed and looked into the darkness. There was never a sign of a Dooley. Just as I was getting into bed again, I heard in the next room the sound that no man in his senses can possibly mistake. The word of a billiard ball down the length of the slates when the striker is stringing for break. No other sound is like it. A minute afterwards there was another whir, and I got into bed. I was not frightened, indeed I was not. I was very curious to know what had become of the Dooleys. I jumped into bed for that reason. Next minute I heard the double click of a cannon, and my hair sat up. It is a mistake to say that hair stands up. The skin of the head tightens, and you can feel a faint, prickly bristling all over the scalp. That is the hair sitting up. There was a whir, and a click, and both sounds could only have been made by one thing. A billet ball. I argued the matter out at great length, with myself, and the more I argued, the less probable it seemed that one bed, one table, and two chairs, all the furniture of the room next to mine, could so exactly duplicate the sounds of a game of billiards. After another cannon, a three-cushion one to judge by the whir, I argued no more. I had found my ghost, and would have given worlds to have escaped from that dark bungalow. I listened, and with each listen the game grew clearer. There was whir on whir and click on click. Sometimes there was a double click and a whir and another click. 
Beyond any sort of doubt, people were playing billiards in the next room. And the next room was not big enough to hold a billiard table. Between the pauses of the wind, I heard the game go forward, stroke after stroke. I tried to believe that I could not hear voices, but that attempt was a failure. Do you know what fear is? Not ordinary fear of insult, injury, or death, but abject, quivering dread of something that you cannot say. Fear that dries the inside of the mouth and half of the throat. Fear that makes you sweat on the palms of the hands and gulp in order to keep the uvula at work. This is a fine fear, a great cowardice, and must be felt to be appreciated. The very improbability of billiards in a dark bungalow proved the reality of the thing. No man, drunk or sober, could imagine a game at billiards or invent the spitting crack of a screw cannon. A severe course of dark bungalows has this advantage. It breeds infinite credulity. If a man said to a confirmed dark bungalow hunter, there is a corpse in the next room, and there's a mad girl in the next but one, and the woman and man on Dad's camel have just eloped from a place sixty miles away. The hearer would not disbelieve, because he would know that nothing is too wild, grotesque, or horrible to happen in a dark bungalow. This credulity, unfortunately, extends to ghosts. A rational person fresh from his own house would have turned on his side and slept. I did not. So surely as I was given up as a bad carcass by the scores of things in the bed, because the bulk of my blood was in my heart, so surely did I hear every stroke of a long game at billiards played in the echoing room behind the iron-barred door. My dominant fear was that the players might want a marker. It was an absurd fear, because creatures who could play in the dark would be above such superfluities. I only know that that was my terror, and it was real. After a long, long while, the game stopped, and the door banged. I slept, because I was dead tired. Otherwise, I should have preferred to have kept awake. Not for everything in Asia would I have dropped the door-bar and peered into the dark of the next room. When the morning came, I considered that I had done well and wisely, and inquired for the means of departure. By the way, Kantama, I said, what were these three doolies doing in my compound in the night? There were no doolies, said the Kantama. I went into the next room, and the daylight streamed through the open door. I was immensely brave. I would, at that hour, have played Blackpool with the owner of the big black pool down below. Has this place always been a dark bungalow? I asked. No, said the Kansama. Ten or twenty years ago, I have forgotten how long it was a billiard room. A how much? A billiard room for the sahibs who built the railway. I was Kansama then in the big house where all the railway sahibs lived, and I used to come across with Brandy Schwab. These three rooms were all one, and they held a big table on which the sahibs played every evening. But the sahibs are all dead now, and the railway runs, you say, nearly to Kabul. Do you remember anything about the sahibs? It is long ago, but I remember that one sahib, a fat man, and always angry, was playing here one night, and he said to me, Mangal Khan, Brandi Pani do. And I filled the glass, and he bent over the table to strike, and his head fell lower and lower, till it hit the table, and his spectacles came off, and when we, the sahibs and I myself, ran to lift him, he was dead. 
I helped to carry him out. Ah, he was a strong sahib. But he is dead, and I, old Mangal Khan, am still living, by your favor. That was more than enough. I had my ghost, a first-hand, authenticated article. I would write to the Society for Psychical Research. I would paralyze the Empire with the news. But I would, first of all, put eighty miles of assessed cropland between myself and that dark bungalow before nightfall. The Society might send a regular agent to investigate later on. I went into my own room and prepared to pack, after noting down the facts of the case. As I smoked, I heard the game begin again, with a miss in bulk this time, for the whir was a short one. The door was open, and I could see into the room. Click, click, that was a cannon. I entered the room without fear, for there was sunlight within, and a fresh breeze without. The unseen game was going on at a tremendous rate, and well it might, when a restless little rat was running to and fro inside the dingy ceiling cloth, and a piece of loose window sash was making fifty bricks off the window boat as it shook in the breeze. Impossible to mistake the sound of billiard balls. Impossible to mistake the whir of a ball over the slate. But I was to be excused. Even when I shut my enlightened eyes, the sound was marvelously like that of a fast game. Entered angrily, the faithful partner of my sorrows, Kadir Baksh. This bungalow is very bad and low caste. I wondered the presence was disturbed and is speckled. Three sets of duly bearers came to the bungalow last night, when I was sleeping outside, and said that it was their custom to rest in the room set apart for the English people. What honour has the Kansama? They tried to enter, but I told them to go. No wonder these Orias have been here, and the presence is sorely spotted. It is shame, and the work of a dirty man. Kadir Baksh did not say that he had taken from each gang two annas for rent in advance, and then, beyond my earshot, had beaten them with the big green umbrella whose use I could never before divine. But Kadir Baksh had no notions of morality. There was an interview with the consumer, but as he promptly lost his head, wrath gave place to pity, and pity led to a long conversation, in the course of which he put the fat engineer sahib's tragic death in three separate stations, two of them fifty miles away. The third shift was to Calcutta, and there the sahib died while driving a dog-cart. If I had encouraged him, the Kansama would have wandered all through Bengal with his corpse. I did not go away as soon as I intended. I stayed for the night, while the wind and the rat and the sash and the window bolt played a ding-dong hundred and fifty up. Then the wind ran out, and the billiard stopped, and I felt that I had ruined my one genuine, hallmarked ghost story. Had I only stopped at the proper time, I could have made anything out of it. That was the bitterest thought of all. End of section one. Recording by J. C. Guan, Montreal, January two thousand and ten.